What does it mean? <laughs> okay. It's not a tsunami warning or anything exciting like that. Okay. <laughs> Evacuate immediately.
Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? So thank you so much for that, that kind introduction. So it's always really great for me to come back to the great Northwest because I was born in this area and raised on Vashon Island. And uh, so I love coming here. This is wherever I go on the planet. This is the center of the universe, rain or shine. And so it's always great to come back to, to UW and, and talk to uh, my friends here um, and hopefully make some new friends. The thing I wanted to, so you can get a sense from Ariel's kind introduction that I wear many hats, uh, which is uh, probably many of you do the same. One of the things which I found myself uh, uh, involved with was um, the NIH's uh, Big Data to Knowledge program, which began a few years ago. Um, and I found myself in the, the role of being the PI of a, a large center grant uh, for uh, data science training in biomedical, uh, biomedical sciences. Um, and so I want to, want to describe to you today is some of the activities that we've undertaken as part of this effort. Um, we think we've done a lot of interesting stuff, so I want to kind of give you a little bit of the backstory of all the different things that we do. Then I want to tell you about a particular resource which we've developed called the Educational uh, Resource Discovery Index, or Erudite, and a little bit about how we're actually applying data science techniques to understanding data science training and education to help people personalize their own data science training. And I think you'll get the gist of all this uh, as I describe this. If any time you have any questions or anything, please raise your hand. We'll make this a little bit of a conversation. And uh, I'm happy to try and uh, address uh, your immediate question. And then if you have questions at the end, of course, we'll, we'll talk about those. And Again, one of the things which is particularly exciting about talking to you guys is that you've already drunk the Kool-Aid on data science, and you have a whole institute devoted to it, um, you know, really covering many of the different activities of data science, but also because it's, again, really great that you guys are here in Seattle, your proximity to massive amounts of data from a number of these particular folks here, but also just in terms of access to biomedical inf information uh, that's suitable for data science techniques is really, really amazing. Um, whether it's Fred Hutch or the Allen Institute or Institute for Systems Biology, whomever it is, 
you guys are really at ground zero for a lot of the types of data science that I'm particularly interested in and that I think the BD2K program was particularly interested in uh, as it got underway as well. So just for those of you who don't know, the uh, Big Data to Knowledge program was uh, a program that uh, is largely reaching the end of its funding activities as an as a, uh, enterprise at the NIH here this summer, um, but really was begun because the NIH realized, I think very rightly so, that we don't collect less data in biomedicine, we keep collecting more. I've been involved with human neuroimaging, as, as Ariel mentioned, as kind of my, my, that's what my day job is. Um, and we don't ever collect less data. We just keep collecting more data. And one of the stories I like to tell my students is that when I was a newly minted postdoctoral fellow, I was asked to go and get a hard disk to store all of our PET imaging data at the time, which we thought was massive. And I went out and I went shopping, and I can't remember what my budget was, but I went out and I bought the biggest self-contained external hard drive that you could buy at that time. And I bought it, and we put it in the lab, and at the time, we thought that four gigabytes was infinity. This was massive. People would come by the lab to gaze upon this massive brute of a storage unit. And it was amazing. And of course, it held that uh, a status as the largest kind of self-contained uh, external drive for all of about, you know, maybe three months uh, before somebody else replaced it. And nowadays, at our institute at the University of Southern California, we have a, a, a storage system, which I won't really talk about too much, but it's very impressive. It's probably among the largest neuroscience dedicated compute clusters on the planet, and we ha we're dealing with storing of, of seven petabytes. Um, and you know, in a few years, that will be considered small. That's just one example of the types of data types that the NIH kind of realized that we're collecting more and more of, and that we needed tools, we needed uh, data management technologies, and a number of other things to be in place so that we could handle, wrangle, make sense of, visualize, and, and uh, interoperate with that data. But importantly, that it played an important role in uh, data science education. And this, for me, this largely uh, uh, interoperates well with what you probably all are very familiar with, and that is the FAIR principles. And this is my crude approximation to them, and I realize they're probably a little more involved in this, but FAIR, of course, being uh, an acronym standing for things that are findable, uh, whatever that resource is, whether it's a data resource, a tool, or it's an educational resource, um, should be easily uh, identifiable um, on the web. Uh, it should be accessible. There should be very few technical barriers that allow you to get access to it. It should be interoperable. It should play well with other resources um, and other places um, it, it should find a, a, a utility. Um, and it should be reusable. It should have a purpose beyond its original intent um, or its original audience. The thing I like to say about this, however, is that there's a silent E at the end of FAIR. And that is for its use in education. That all of these, uh, whether they're data, whether they're tools, or in this case, educational resources can be utilized um, for the purposes of training the next generation of biomedical data scientists um, as we move this very uh, complex uh, uh, field forward in trying to understand the body, the brain, um, in form and in function. So the BD2K program was actually very large. It had a number of different aspects to it. Many of them, most of them, in fact, had something to do with training and education. So this is sort of a kind of pie chart, which is maybe not quite resolving very well here. But uh, for those of you who kind of know a little bit about NIH grant speak, uh, these are the, the different types of, of funding mechanisms uh, that were supported for training and education. Um, so the U24, that's the grant that uh, I'm the PI of. But there were a number of R25 grants, K01 grants, uh, T32 and T15 grants. And U54 Centers of Excellence, of which we also have one um, at USC called the uh, Big Data for Discovery Science Center. Um, and each one of those, uh, there were about, let's see, 12, I suppose, I, I think, um, uh, of these U54 centers. And all of them had a component dedicated in their budget for training and education. Several um, of uh, your uh, UW colleagues um, had some of these R25s. Um, uh, Daniela Witten, many of you may know. Um, I'll show you a slide in a second uh, which breaks these down. Um, uh, Eli uh, Shojai um, uh, from the University of Washington also had one. Here's just kind of a, a, of a list of all these different training awards. In the umpteen years that I've been working on large scale pr uh, programs uh, at the NIH, this was the largest kind of educational investment that I had ever seen. 
Um, and I thought that was really exciting and a fantastic opportunity for all of these people to be developing um, data science research programs at places like the University of Washington, to having K awards to develop their, you know, their personal careers, um, as well as having um, T32 and, and other sorts of um, institutional training awards. Um, so it was really, really rich. Part of our effort through this data, um, uh, uh, training coordinating center activity was to help kind of be the big cheerleaders for all of those activities. While it's like coordination, it sort of suggests some sort of a top-down sort of organization that we would dictate what people did. It actually wasn't what we ever intended to do. Rather, we were kind of positioned to be the biggest cheerleaders and promoters of the data science training activities which were going on. And so we had kind of a number of different roles. We had you know, promote things through a, a website, which I'll d describe a little bit more uh, in a moment. Um, work with all of these different awardees through a variety of working groups in terms of data science core competencies, um, resource discovery, uh, diversity, um, and the inclusion of women in science and women in data science, um, and career path development. Um, indexing of training materials, which I'll describe a little bit in a second, a science rotation program and public outreach, and interactions with a number of different other uh, groups um, through scoping workshops and a thing called the Innovation Lab, which were actually a little more didactic uh, in terms of their framework. And I'll touch on a little bit on those uh, in a second. Um, one of the things we put a real premium on was the development of a, of a website that was kind of our kind of portal to all this. Uh, we called it BigDataU.org, and you can visit this yourselves, and I, ho I hope you do, um, which was really a personalized kind of library of data science training materials that you could go and, uh, and search, and I'll describe a little bit more about that uh, in a second, um, where people could go and personalize their own data science training program, things they were interested in. What I like to describe this as is taking, indexing a whole bunch of MOOCs so that people could disassemble them and create a Franken MOOC out of the parts of all the other MOOCs. Uh, so that you could personalize your particular training. And this is kind of what uh, this looks like, and I'll describe a little bit more about uh, what all this means uh, in a second. Just over the last 12 months, we've gotten a, a, a lot of, uh, of activity. I won't go through all of these things, but uh, just to show that uh, you, know, you have to kind of show your, your web metrics uh, anymore, just really just to show that this is starting to really gain some traction uh, amongst uh, people who are interested in learning more about data science in biomedicine, um, and so we've been excited by the re responsivity we've seen. Um, here are just a number of the different uh, kind of training resources that people have uh, uh, kind of resonated with them. Um, and I'll, I'll describe again a little bit more about all of this in a moment. But the people who tend to come to visit the, the site uh, and the number of registered users tend to be people with PhDs, um, postdocs, uh, junior faculty, and whatnot, which is actually kind of right where we kind of want to be, is uh, particularly those people who are, maybe they've maybe got a PhD, they're in biomedical sciences, but they you know, really want to retool themselves with some of the um, uh, tools and techniques and, and uh, capabilities and concepts that you uh, identify uh, as data science. A um, couple other, this is other, some social media engagement things, which I think are uh, uh, kind of interesting. Um, and I'll describe this a little bit more in a moment. A um, couple of different activities that we've done. Before I get into kind of some of our stuff with indexing of data science training content, we actually undertake a number of different activities which some of you may be interested in um, for the future. One of the things that we do is uh, usually most every Friday, in fact, this coming Friday, uh, I'll be doing another one of these, where we host what's called the BD2 Gate. BD2K Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science and it's a webinar series. Uh, we run this every Fridays uh, at uh, 9 a.m., most every Fridays at 9 a.m. Pacific, um, and you can visit it by uh, coming to uh, this URL. It's actually jointly um, uh, organized by our training coordinating center as well as what's called the BD2K Centers Coordinating Center or the CCC. Um, and the Cedar Center, which is based at um, Stanford University and the National Institutes of Health. And what we've done is we've tried to uh, coerce, strong arm, uh, uh, basically lie to uh, our data science colleagues to get them to um, participate in this. And uh, this is just uh, kind of an array of various people who have taken part in this to date. Um, we actually have quite a number of very uh, um, exciting 
uh, leading data science uh, experts uh, present on their particular topics of interest. And we've tried to ask them to pitch these at sort of a advanced graduate student level so that most people can come and uh, kind of understand what uh, it is they're talking about. And it's really meant to be the foundational principles of data science that one would need to know in order to become a data scientist yourself. So if you have any master's degree students or say um, you know, or early PhD students who are interested, um, there's probably a topic there uh, for them. Uh, again, a number of, of uh, very interesting people have uh, had the opportunity to present. So I do encourage you to check that out. One additional thing that we do is something called the, um, the Data Science Innovation Labs. And these are a program that we um, got started with the idea of getting about 30 people, half of which are biomedical scientists around a particular annual topic that we choose, and 15 data scientists who ordinarily don't know each other, don't really interact, and we bring them together in a five-day workshop with the idea of being that we would have a facilitated and mentored program for team development, um, bring them together around a particular topic, and by the end of the five-day period, they will have produced the essence of a small NIH grant or NSF grant. So they basically go from zero to a draft proposal in five days. And the first year that we did this, we did this um, at uh, the uh, Lake Arrowhead Conference Center, which is a very beautiful uh, conference center, um, just kind of uh, north and, and uh, east of Los Angeles, um, around the topic of mobile health or mHealth as a source of big data. Um, and uh, I've learned now that we've had at least two of those proposals that people developed uh, got kind of materialized uh, or matured rather into full on uh, supported and funded uh, uh, grants. So that was very exciting for us. And um, the, here's just kind of uh, an example of the kind of activities that go on. Again, this is facilitated and mentored. So we have a facilitation group who comes in and through a series of very you know, kind of creative lateral thinking exercises, gets people to kind of think differently about the, the projects that they would want to do together. Um, and it's, it's mentored, so we have experts in the fields of the, the topic that's chosen or data science come and provide feedback on the, the projects. Um, and it ends up being a very interesting um, event that uh, we've run every summer. And uh, we've actually had some repeat customers. They liked it so much the first time that they did it again. Uh, in uh, last year, we did one um, at the Wiley and Conference Center, which is uh, northeast of Boston, um, on the topic of the microbiome. And so that may be of interest to, to many of you as a source of big data. Um, and the microbiome is it's intense. Uh, I, not being a microbiomicist, uh, it really made me think differently about uh, a number of different things <laughs> that revolve around the microbiome. Um, but that was a very interesting, it's like a, like a master's class in understanding the microbiome and the data science needed to understand it. It was very cool. One we're doing this coming summer uh, is on the mathematics of single cell dynamics. And we're doing this uh, just uh, kind of south of here in Bend, Oregon. Um, and we're uh, looking forward to this. We're already reviewing the applicants for this. And uh, we look forward to continuing this uh, in uh, coming years as well on various topics. And um, so we're, we're looking forward to this. One final thing I, I want to mention in terms of our, our kind of things that we actually do ourselves in terms of training is something called the Data Science Road Trip Program. And this is a, uh, something that one applies to um, as a junior uh, biomedical scientist where we attempt to partner you with more senior data scientists who have the resources and the, the technical and computational resources to be able to take your big data set and help you to turn it into something that's potentially fundable, potentially a research article, or some, com some conference presentation. Um, and so uh, this is really kind of a, 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 like a, a match.com process where we try and match you up based on your interests and either current or future interests. And then those junior fellows, what we could take to the road. They do take a road trip to go to the senior data scientist's uh, laboratory, bringing their data so that they can then undertake this uh, at least two week long visit with them. And then the idea is to fund about 10 of these and have them turn into something like a conference paper, uh, a peer reviewed publication, or possibly even a grant application. Um, and we've been very successful in, in several of those uh, different um, activities. And uh, we're now in the kind of the second year of this, and um, they're just about wrapping up our road trippers. 
So one of the uh, key things that we, we are from Hollywood, after all, and uh, so we wanted to kind of uh, capture some of the spirit of data science and uh, big data in terms of um, biomedicine uh, as, a, as a film. And if you go to uh, this URL, you could just uh, search for big data biomedicine on, on YouTube, uh, you'll find that uh, we did this very stylish little movie. It's about 20 minutes long or so. And because we are from Hollywood, we've also made a sequel, which will be coming out uh, here anytime. Um, which is, well, this one is really focused on some of the research motivations and why scientifically the challenges of big data um, present themselves in biomedicine. The, the sequel that we have is a little more patient focused. What's in it for the patient to try and collect as much data as they can and take control of their own personal big data to be able to guide their uh, particular health um, decisions? So anyway, uh, do watch for that. That will be coming out uh, as well. One of the uh, things we're also plugged in as we're, we're plugged into a, a, a network of international data science training uh, enterprises. Um, one of which, uh, these is Elixir. Um, just uh, on, on last Thursday and Friday, I was just at a meeting in the Netherlands, uh, which was run by the Elixir people, um, who large, also have a mandate to guide data science training in the sciences. Um, this uh, also includes a group called BioCaddy, uh, H3 Africa is looking at uh, data science training related activities throughout the African continent, which is kind of interesting, um, as well as our center's coordinating center. And we've had a couple of get togethers, most recently this one in the Netherlands. We had one last year in, in Huntington Beach, and we have a white paper coming out uh, very s shortly promoting the activities of, of data science on an international scale, which I think is going to be uh, pretty important. So one of the main things, this is kind of one of the main things I wanted to talk to you guys about, is um, something that was mandated to us under the RFA for our Big Data to Knowledge uh, Training Coordinating Center. And that is the indexing of educational resources in something called the Educational Resource Discovery Index, or Erudite. And the idea was to facilitate people's being able to discover, access, and, and cite educational resources through this particular database. Uh, we wanted to design it uh, as a framework which could be enriched in multiple ways. Either you could automatically scrape content from the web and populate it, you could uh, do it by hand, or even you'd be able to learn what sort of, of, um, uh, of you know, how, how you might uh, apply machine learning to it to mine it, cluster it, and suggest possible uh, routes through this big collection of, of data that would allow you to personalize your own training. Um, we wanted to leverage all sorts of social media and whatnot and have direct linkages with groups like the Elixir. The, the, this is this TESS is their training platform. Uh, is ha have direct linkages with that and link with other major international organizations. This is the, the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility, um, something that Ariel has had uh, a lot of interactivity with um, in recent years. Um, and mine, MOOC courses, courses from uh, in Coursera, edX, um, uh, various other places, index all of that, as well as what's coming out of the BD2K into this Erudite database. And so this is a very complex and, and, and uh, unneededly uh, uh, colorful slide. But just to give you some sort of an idea of that we have to, in order to develop this, we need to have a resource collection phase, a description phase, and then have a number of different things that, that act on that in order to then populate and make uh, usable this, this web portal. And I want to kind of describe a little bit about that. In terms of the uh, gathering this data, not only are these educational resources being generated by the BD2K funded centers, um, they're also coming from places, again, like YouTube or Udacity or Coursera or edX, you name it. Um, and we wanted to be able to have a way to automatically scrape them. So we developed a scraping technology um, that uh, is programmed in Python. It uses a number of kind of commonly available libraries. Um, but we've uh, built this such that we can point this at a particular website, and it will attempt to go in and, once it knows how to do it, automatically scrape the content out of there and make an index into Erudite. Now, keep in mind that we're not copying the actual video content. We're not taking that and storing it. Rather, we're just getting the metadata information where it exists. So this would be like, you know, what's the content uh, about? What format is it in? How long is that video? That sort of thing. 
in addition to uh, its title and abstract and who the presenters are. Um, and in order to kind of help to develop this, uh, we've also built a uh, kind of an ontological framework for classifying these uh, video content um, using our uh, video classifier that we've got. So for an ex as an example of this, uh, we were interested in seeing if we could develop this using YouTube content as the, the grist for this mill. And so the goal was to identify the high quality educational value, valuable online videos um, which were relevant to data science, um, biomedical data science in particular. And so we went and we searched uh, YouTube for terms from something that we've called the Data Science Education Ontology or DSEO. And this is something which is we're developing in concert with a number of others from around the world, including um, folks from Elixir and from folks in, in Europe and, and South Africa. Um, and so we went and we built this up. And over 99 different searches, we were able to find over 10 million different results um, uh, from those. Uh, 130,000 were unique videos were then downloaded a number of different playlists. We gathered all the metadata and transcripts from those. So we actually did speech to text to turn them all into text. Um, and then we went and we looked at the, the top 100 results for, or sorry, top 1,000 results for each search. And then we attempted to run a classifier over them to try and help reinforce uh, what our um, ontolo ontological framework looks like. So this is just, you don't have to read this necessarily, but this is just kind of showing you a histogram of all the different searches that we did that had something to do with data science and ecology, data science and the Perl programming language, uh, data science and the Galaxy, a workflow engine, et cetera. And we went and we took all this and we then used the, the top 1,000 searches from, from each one of those. And you can understand the, the, comp uh, the, the computer science challenge, the data science challenge that this in itself exists uh, that uh, has, has to it. That is, we have to have a data source, uh, a resource database. We have to go extract the resource text. So we have to do, uh, for a video, we might uh, run the text, uh, speech to text. Uh, we might have all the metadata associated with it. We have to go through and process that uh, by removing stop words and doing the, the traditional kind of text uh, manipulation, vectorizing that, uh, running some algorithms over it, and then doing some uh, concept classifiers so that we can then have predicted for every resource what concepts in data science that's attempting to, uh, to capture. And we may have this for not just one resource, but two resources and all resources, have our curation interface uh, in the mix so that a human rater can go in and say, yes, I agree with how this has been classified. And then this can continue so it can improve itself. In trying to do this, um, this is some work that's been done by our colleagues at the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. Many of you are probably familiar with that. Um, Jose Luis Ambite and his team uh, were able to go in and instantiate this process. And by looking at dimensions in the, the data uh, related to the domain of data science, its resource format, resource depth, basically is it more of an advanced course, is it intermediate, or is it, is it uh, uh, for, uh, for novices? Um, data science processing, um, programming tools and data types. These are the F1 statistics, which to me sort of resemble a like an R squared statistic. The closer to one they are, one is good, zero is bad. And these are not doing too bad um, in terms of this. So we've built up um, this DSEO uh, ontological framework, which we think classifies quite well automatically um, using our tools. In so doing and applying this, we've been able to ingest into the Erudite database over 10,000 different uh, video resources coming from the BD2K uh, uh, awardees themselves, uh, from edX, Coursera, Udacity, uh, a large number from video lectures, YouTube, and a number of other places. And now we have taken these and we've indexed them, sometimes with descriptions, sometimes with, say, additional things like their slides or additional text um, into Erudite for people to be able to search through. So uh, we, in doing this, we created uh, what we call a user dashboard, or the ability for you to create your own personalized research plans. Um, so here's what this might, uh, or it does look like. You can log in, and you can drag and drop these little squares around. Those little squares represent any resource which you have identified that you want to include as part of your personalized research training plan. You can change their relative size. You can change their color. And if you click on any one of them, they take you to a detailed description of that particular um, data science training resource. Um, and then you can mark it as completed. You can save it. You can leave notes to yourself. 
And the system also makes suggestions about, well, if you watch this particular resource, you might also like these resources. So it can begin to tell you about different resources that you might also be interested in. And uh, these are, have a number of different things. You can you know, sort things uh, by the type of the resource. You can look at it by its average star rating. So we're hoping to be able to, to get people to uh, give their own impressions of whether or not this was a valuable resource or whether it wasn't. Um, and these learning plans, uh, as we call them, can then be taken and shared with others so that if you wanted to learn about uh, Bayesian statistics and you created a, a, a training plan for it, you could share that with others so they could take advantage of it. Here's an example of what this looks like in terms of being able to search it, and I hope that you'll all uh, attempt to do this. If you go and you, uh, we have a search bar here, and you type in deep learning, it will give you, uh, in this case, uh, 5,101 different results that have something to do uh, with deep learning. We have up here a ways to conditionalize your search so you can go in and apply some uh, logic to it. So for example, you may want to be interested in only particular programming tools. Uh, and again, these are based upon our DSEO um, ontological framework that we have. And you can go in and say, OK, I'm only interested in those things which have to do with uh, deep learning and Python. You can select this. And uh, then you can go and find out that the number of resources quickly do drops down to 47. Um, and then you can click on any one of these uh, and, and find out more about them. One other thing in terms of just being able to search, that's very nice. But we've, I'm sorry, did you have a question, sir? We try and only stick to free stuff. If there's a paywall in the way, we've tended to, to go away from those because largely we don't want to basically put somebody into a, you know, we've got this great search tool, but all it does is put you at a paywall. We, we try to avoid those things. So these are all directly accessible once you've been able to, to connect with them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we have human uh, people who are you know, in the loop here who go through and try to weed out the cat videos. You know, the da cat, cat data science is not really an emerging field, so we've tried to filter those out. Um, we have gotten some interesting examples of there was, a, um, there was a musical group who wrote a song called Big Data, and it got ingested <laughs> into the, to the uh, to erudite. And when you started to watch the video, when you started to watch it, you were kind of like, OK, I could see how this might actually have some relevance. And then soon, then it, would, it degenerated into like, you know, a music video. And you realize we had to go filter that out by hand. So we, we do have human in the loop to try and filter that stuff out. And also, we do look at things like um, you know, the, uh, the, the video quality. You know, is it at high enough resolution? Um, is it associated with a university in contrast to, say, a corporate entity? So we, we have some things in there that help to make sure that we're not ingesting, you know, garbage, having a garbage in, garbage out problem. But it's a very good question. And also we hope that by people watching things and rating them, that value will emerge by people, you know, from crowdsourcing it, if you will. Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. So you could say, you know, yes, it, you know, the, the, the video has to be of these, you know, particular themes, but it has to be of a high enough quality and it has to have, you know, four out of five stars. So, yes, all of those things uh, are, are possible. In fact, the little interface I just showed you, we've actually updated it so you can sort things by the star rating um, and other, you know, other dimensions. One of the things, because one of the ways in which this was described in the RFA for the BD2K Training Coordinating Center is that the NIH wanted a knowledge map. They kept referring to as the erudite knowledge map. And to me, that meant you know, we wanted a visual of what this space was of all of these training resources as a mapping. So I took that very seriously in working with our uh, information sciences colleagues, as well as getting some uh, people who are expert in the development of graphical interfaces for the web, uh, we've created a number of different things which are uh, really kind of attractive. We have this, what we call kind of a bubble map, 
where each of these bubbles is uh, kind of one of the dimensions of our DSEO ontological framework. And each one of these squares, we've shown them all here uh, for just uh, uh, purposes of display. But as you tunnel into this, you can click on this and it'll tunnel in and tunnel in until you can identify those resources which are part of that particular bubble. Or you know, it's like a big Venn diagram. And that's all very interactive and works on the web. Another way we've done it is through our resource topic mapping. This is basically a graphical representation of that ontological framework I mentioned. Um, and then we also have, we done a number of different statistics that show you that you know, of 100% of all the resources which are kind of in erudite, you know, machine learning is very popular um, and, and well represented, a knowledge representation, data analysis, and so forth. Um, so we've tried to create clever ways for people to interactively navigate erudite as a knowledge map. So here's just one, this example of this uh, kind of resource topic map uh, with different lines that connect them. Part of the idea here is that if you want to, say, identify things about machine learning, you can click on this. And in so doing, you'll show all the kind of feeding in paths that go into machine learning and all the different attributes or, or rather different uh, aspects of machine learning that might be of interest to you, whether it's causality, regression, classification, et cetera. And it, you'd also be able to select, OK, I want only video content. And there, the, the bubbles change color. And then I want you know, genomic and proteomic data types. Uh, so you can identify these. And then these directly um, link into, oh, you can also select the level of focus if it's introductory or advanced. And the idea being is that once you click on this, you'll be able to see these little squares, which are the representations of each one of those resources, which satisfy that degree of you know, granularity that you're, you're looking for. Um, and so if you go in and click on those, it would then take you to them. Now, we, so we've created this thing, right, this erudite database. And yet, when you look at this, you, know, you can do searches on it and whatnot, and you're trying to develop your own personalized training plan. There's no real hint to you about where you would begin in creating this. You could go and do a search. You could take these little squares. You could fill up that little colorful matrix of, of different squares. But how do you actually go and understand the prerequisite knowledge that you need to know in terms of being able to do this particular course? You know, you, you're going to look at this video. Well, you need to know all about matrix algebra before. If you don't know that, you're going to get lost. You might need to know, you know, differential equation modeling before you get into something. Uh, and if you don't have that, you might be lost. And then likewise, you needed to have that course be a prerequisite of anything else you were interested in. So the particular data science challenge for us, now that we have built this, is how can we extract that information automatically? Or rather, it's one thing we're particularly interested in. The notion of developing learning paths. And this is particularly interesting, because if I'm a professor and I'm trying to develop a course on human neuroanatomy, which I've done, uh, I would want to know, uh, or I would want my students to know, you're going to learn about this, 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 this. I expect you to have come in with this knowledge. I'm going to teach you about these things. And by the end of the course, you're going to know this, this, and this. Well, somebody who's taking charge of their own personalized training may not know what those prerequisites are. They may not know all the different things they would want to know in order to make themselves expert in Bayesian analysis, for example, and what they should be expected to know at the end. So we're presented with kind of an interesting challenge because the uh, activity here um, is instead of being tutor-type experts, like where I'm the professor and I'm going to teach you, they're trying to teach themselves. And this is the learner themselves has taken control of how they do this. And we want to be able to come up with a, a way to help them. So somebody who's not familiar with what skills are needed or what goals they are attempting to, to, to get to, uh, they might be able to use this to do so. And so we wondered whether or not we could employ data science techniques themselves to make helpful suggestions about suitable learning paths. And in so doing, we wanted to like, take our big corpus of stuff, as represented by this big circle here, this patchy circle, and find pathways through all this um, that would help people to be able to go from point A in this idea of a knowledge map to point B in some sort of a sensible pathway that got them there in some sort of logical series of steps, understanding there's prerequisite knowledge and subsequent knowledge, and we could make a chain. Does that make sense? So uh, we wanted to use topic modeling to automatically generate a statistical model from through this corpus of stuff to be able to do this. And so what we've attempted to do is try to, what I'm going to try and illustrate here, we've developed a, what we kind of consider this you know, galaxy of these different 
resources, or every resource, it's like a YouTube video, is represented just by one of these dots here. And they're kind of arranged in some sort of you know, semi-random order. We might be able to, and what we've done is cluster them. This is effectively the results of our running our automated, class, automated classifier over them, grouping them into this DSEO classification scheme. But the next challenge that we want to do is for somebody who's over here, how do I get over here in terms of how do, what pathway do I follow here? Well, the most direct line may not be the most sensible one, the least kind of Euclidean distance. Perhaps you need to follow a concept distance in order to get from one part of the map to the other, effectively doing this little thing where you're, go you're going and you're connecting these dots in terms of this is a prerequisite for this, this is a prerequisite for this, this is kind of a child of this here, and by walking around through this very kind of almost looks like a random walk uh, process would get you from one point in this knowledge map to this other point in this knowledge map. This is the challenge that we're trying to undertake now. We're just beginning this process because it's actually it's pretty hard. But uh, in order to do this, we feel that we would not only be able to connect these different things in some sort of order within these domains, but then connect you across these domains so that you could go from you know, understanding the basics of statistics um, all the way through to you know, getting into some very severe, um, uh, sort of very complex machine learning models, for example. Uh, in doing this, we're using a thing called cross entropy, where, and the idea is that, for example, if you're talking about water, you're not necessarily talking about boats, but they might, they're certainly related to one another. On the other hand, if you're talking about, if it's a video about boats, chances are it's going to have water discussed in it as well. If we can work out the differential relationship between these resources and their particular order of them, uh, then we can, uh, and according to some sort of a thresholding, we'd be able to understand that a particular resource was really focused on boats, but not on water. I hope that kind of makes sense. And it, by then understanding the relative information content of those, um, that we would be able to then order things uh, appropriately. So here's what we're, we've, we've gotten with this. It's not done yet, but I wanted to share it with you because I think it's kind of slick. So we also, in addition to all of our erudite databases, uh, database that we've built, we're also interested in linking those resources with books, for example, that are on that particular topic out of Google Books. So we've actually gone and indexed an awful lot out of Google Books that relate to data science, attempting to pair them up with particular data science resources. Um, and so we've run this uh, natural language processing statistical method um, to learn the conceptual structure of this um, and to, with the idea of trying to detect pedagogically valuable resources and organize them and sort them into particular order. So this is a, uh, a cluster map of all of this. So this is not only erudite content. Each one of these dots represents a particular resource or a book um, out of them. Uh, there's I think, at least 10,000 and counting dots in here. And if you zoom in on it, you can see that uh, we've labeled over the kind of the average uh, uh, label here, um, what, in this case, uh, bio, bioinformatics, computational biology, those dots uh, relate to that. And so we've created that cluster space, which I, I showed. And now the goal is to try and figure out, if I'm here in this space, uh, how do I get over here? We're trying to go through and do this now systematically by, approach, uh, 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 by using this cross-entropy-based thing. And these are some very crude results. But we're able to uh, identify those things which have to do with, with deep learning, for example, in contrast to neural networks, or things that uh, for example, our uh, regression modeling in contrast to, say, things which are like business analytics. So we can understand that one of these things kind of comes before the other. And so we're, we're working on this uh, to be able to uh, then allow people to say, OK, I'm here. How can I get over there? And then people will be, it'll be a suggestion, you know, not a, not a program, but a suggestion. And of course, that leads to being able to then take resources and order them appropriately. And we have a number of different goals, which I won't kind of go into too much detail on, about how we're going to kind of move this piece forward here. We have a paper under uh, development, which we hope to have done by this summer. 
there you go. <laughs> and uh, so we'll, we'll be uh, uh, looking at that. Now, one of the things that also uh, this, this comes up with is it comes up with the idea of being able to order these things. We want to be able to take this order that we generate or that we allow people to make adjustments on and turn it into a curriculum view so that you can use our same tool here to uh, look at the sorting order that we've identified for a particular curriculum that people have assembled. Um, of course, anybody would be able to go in and drag and drop these resources from one part of the order to another to be able to, you know, I think this really kind of goes before this. And also, that becomes information that would get fed back into the system to know, oh, okay, somebody who's an expert in this has said this comes before this. And we can use that information to help uh, uh, in the, in the um, generation of future pathways so that uh, we can order these things appropriately. And then when somebody goes and they look at their particular research, uh, uh, their training plan here, they would be able to follow this. They could have multiple plans. Uh, and you might imagine these as almost like a book of resources where you may have one particular plan which is like everything related to the, say, basics of machine learning. And then the next chapter, if you will, is you know uh, it, applications of basic uh, machine learning. And then you may have multiple of these, and you could eventually create a full library of different virtualized training plans that represent kind of a book uh, of how you would learn about a particular data science topic that was of interest to you. You could share these with others and effectively 